All right, welcome back. Uh, next up is our directors panel, which is always a, a true highlight of this conference. Um, let me start uh, by introducing everybody very briefly. Uh, Brad Bondi is a moderator today. He's uh, someone who's been a part of every securities enforcement forum we've had since 2012, a partner in Cahill's litigation department. Uh, Brad previously served as a member of the executive staff of the SEC, as counsel for two commissioners for enforcement actions and regulatory rulemaking. Brad, thanks so much for moderating this great panel and welcome. Thank you. Uh, next up, welcome to Stephanie Avakian, who is now a partner at Wilmer Hale. Until last year, of course, Stephanie was the Director of Enforcement at the SEC and before that, the co-director. It has always been fantastic having Stephanie with us during her time with the agency. And, and now that she's back in private practice, uh, thank you so much, Stephanie, and welcome. Uh, next, let me introduce George Canellis, a partner at Millbank. George was previously co-director of the SEC's Division of Enforcement, also the director of the New York office, uh, and of course, also previously a longtime federal prosecutor in the SDNY. Welcome, George. Thanks, Andrew Serezny is a partner at Debevoise and Plimpton and co-chair of the litigation department. Andrew is uh, director of enforcement from 2013 to 2017 and has been the keynote of this event in both DC and San Francisco. I think you hold the distinction of the only one to do that, if I'm not mistaken. Um, earlier in his career, he was an AUSA in the Southern District of New York as well. Great to have you, Andrew, thank you. Uh, we are so pleased to be joined this year by Gurbir Grewal, who beginning in July of this year has been serving as the director of the SEC's D Division of Enforcement. Uh, previously, Gurbir served as the New Jersey Attorney General, and before that as the Bergen County Prosecutor, which is the chief law enforcement officer of the most populous county in New Jersey. From 2010 to 2016, Gerbier worked as an AUSA in the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of New Jersey. Thank you so much for joining us, and welcome, Gerbier. Thanks for having me. Uh, Bill McLucas is a partner, Wilmer Hale, Wilmer, Wilmer Hale, excuse me, chair of the firm's securities department. Uh, he joined that firm after serving for eight years as director of enforcement. Welcome, Bill. Yeah. Um, pleased to welcome Steve Pekin, uh, now a partner at Sullivan Cromwell in New York. Uh, from 2017 to 2020, he was, along with Stephanie, co-director of the Division of Enforcement, and before that, an AUSA, also in the Southern, Dis Southern District of New York, and a, a partner at Sullivan and Cromwell. Steve, thanks so much for joining us. Pleasure. Finally, uh, please introduce Dick Walker, who is a partner at King & Spalding. Uh, he joined that firm after almost 14 years as general counsel for uh, Deutsche Bank. And previously, of course, Dick was the director of the enforcement division and general counsel of the SEC as well. Uh, Dick, so great to see you and welcome. Thank you, Bruce. All right, let me turn it back over to Brad. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, Bruce. Grabeira, thank you for joining us. Welcome to your first director's panel. Uh, we very much appreciate you being here. And as is the tradition, we always go to the current director first um, for opening remarks. And you'll also have the last word. Uh, do you want to have a few opening remarks for the audience? Uh, th thanks, Brad. And uh, I appreciate that tradition because knowing some of my predecessors, both by reputation uh, and experience, I may not get in a word otherwise. So <laughs> I'll take advantage of uh, this opportunity. Uh, in all seriousness, it's an honor uh, to be here among so many of my predecessors. I want to start uh, by thanking each of them for their careful stewardship of the division. Uh, and I look forward to talking about today how I hope to build on the foundation that they each have laid here. Uh, that's important to me. I view this role uh, as a caretaker role that I want to uh, build on their successes and leave it better for the next person, uh, a little bit better than I found it. Uh, when you talk about uh, sort of vision and how we do that, to me, a key component of our efforts, and I've talked about this before, has to be restoring trust in our financial markets and institutions. Uh, Americans' trust in our institutions, whether it be government or financial institutions, is at near historic lows. This has been borne out by survey after survey uh, and even electoral results uh, as recently as yesterday. Uh, I saw this firsthand as, as attorney general, and I see it today in my role as director as well. And so 
relevant to today's discussion, I think it's repeated lapses by large businesses, gatekeepers, uh, other market participants, uh, coupled with, with the perception or, or misperception really that we, the regulators, are failing to hold uh, them appropriately accountable ha has contributed to this decline. And, and as a result of that, I think some people really do believe that there are two sets of rules out there, one for the big and powerful and another for everyone else. And all of us would agree that is bad for our markets. It's bad for our economy. It's bad for our future. So the question then naturally becomes, you know, what can we do about it? In other words, how can we maintain and enhance that trust? For us at the enforcement division, I think it means working with a sense of urgency. And it means focusing on three things. One is robust enforcement. Two is robust remedies. And three is robust compliance. You need all three of those pillars to support that public trust. And let me just touch briefly, because we'll have an opportunity uh, during our conversation to, to go into more detail. Let me just touch briefly on what I mean by each. When it comes to, to robust enforcement, I think we have to continue to cover the entire securities waterfront. But at the same time, we need to work diligently to protect investors from new and emerging threats in, in areas like crypto, cyber, SPAC, uh, SPAC space uh, or ESG. And we have to do, as I mentioned a second ago, our work with a sense of urgency. And we have to do it without fear or favor. And, and as part of that work, we also have to focus on gatekeeper accountability. Uh, gatekeepers, whether they be auditors, accountants, uh, attorneys, underwriters, uh, are often the first lines of defense against misconduct. And, and when they fail to live up to their obligations, investors and, and the integrity of our market suffers. So this is nothing new. This, is, uh, this has been a focus of my predecessors and we'll continue to take a hard look at gatekeepers to ensure that they're fulfilling their professional responsibilities and not giving cover uh, to corporations or executives engaged in possible misconduct. And, and robust enforcement also includes the potential for admissions in appropriate cases. I talked about this a couple of weeks ago. You would think I was breaking new ground. This is a playbook that, that Andrew and, and Chair White put into place. Uh, it's a tool that my predecessors used. Uh, when it comes to accountability, I think few things rival the magnitude of wrongdoers actually admitting that they broke the law. And so admissions are a way to send a strong message uh, to other market participants to stamp out misconduct, to self-report any misconduct. And so we'll continue uh, to focus on, on uh, admissions in appropriate cases. When it comes to, to robust remedies, we must seek penalties that, that have both a specific and, and general deterrent effect. And where appropriate, we also need to look for prophylactic remedies and, and protect investors from future harm. And the factors that we look at in, 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 this, uh, in this area are really no surprise. Uh, you know, the factors that guide our penalty recommendations are not a secret. We assess uh, the conduct at issue. Uh, we look at the statutory tiers. Uh, we look at judicial opinions, we look at comparable cases, but the way we think about those factors may evolve. For example, we will assess whether penalties in, in prior comparable cases have been sufficient to appropriately deter the misconduct at issue. So where they haven't been, where we're seeing repeated misconduct in a particular space or by a particular group of actors or uh, specific actor, you could expect us to seek uh, more aggressive penalties, both in settlement negotiations and, and if necessary in litigation as well. Uh, you know, the prophylactic relief that I'm talking about, officer and director bars, uh, conduct-based injunctions, uh, robust undertakings, that's an important part uh, of our toolkit and, and we're going to look to use it in appropriate situations. And, and the third uh, part of this effort is compliance. That's also essential to restoring that trust I talked about. And this is a shared responsibility. Uh, it's a shared responsibility between us, gatekeepers, uh, who, who have to work to, to foster a culture of proactive compliance and responsibility, both for themselves and their clients. We're in a, a period of profound and rapid uh, technological change. And so, you know, I had an opportunity to speak at, at length on this. We need to be thinking rigorously about how, uh, or actually, gatekeepers need to be thinking rigorously, as do we, about how uh, their business model and products interact with emerging risks and uh, emerging technologies and, and our enforcement priorities and, and tailor their uh, compliance practices accordingly. So 
Uh, it's my hope that through continuing the work uh, of those who came before me, that robust enforcement, that robust uh, looking for robust remedies and robust compliance, uh, we'll do our part in restoring that trust and enhancing it uh, through our work here at the Enforcement Division. Terrific, Rabir. I, I appreciate those opening remarks, and we um, will certainly talk about several of those topics that you've raised. Um, let me start, though, with a, a bit of some softballs. Um, you've only been at the SEC for a few <laughs> months. What have been some surprises during your tenure? Uh, you know, I think a couple of things, three things stand out for me uh, as, as, as I reflect on, on the first hundred days or, or the last three months. I, I think uh, the first thing is obviously the scope and breadth of the work that's done here. Uh, a close friend of mine asked me why I was looking forward, what I was looking forward to most in my new role. Uh, and, and I said to them that I was, I was looking forward to, you know, focusing on one area of the law. As attorney general, I had 16 divisions. I had 8,000 uh, public servants in the Department of Law and Public Safety. And every day it was something different, a different crisis, a different area of the law. It turns out that this one area is, is, is vast. It is broad. And every day there's something new, something, uh, you know, th there are parts of it that are arcane, parts of it that are, are being shaped and reshaped by the courts, still other parts that are are developing uh, and evolving as we speak, depending on uh, who you ask. So I think uh, that's something that really stands out and was a surprise to me. As an AUSA and as a state regulator, you know, my interactions uh, with the SEC were limited in, in, in the anti-fraud space mostly, uh, some policy type work. But once I got here, uh, it was apparent to me that the waterfront uh, is broad and, and the issues we deal with are many. Um, the second thing um, that has surprised me, and it probably shouldn't have surprised me because I did work with the staff in prior roles, is, is I'm just incredibly impressed by the talent of the staff, uh, the thoroughness of their investigations, their thoughtfulness, their subject matter expertise in, in, a, in a variety of different areas, the quality of the lawyering, the quality of the writing. Uh, and a related point, and really the third thing that, that stands out from my, my first few months here is the, the resilience of the staff also amazes me. You know, we're emerging from a once in a lifetime pandemic. We've been in a remote posture for however many months, uh, but the staff has continued to serve the public and, and advance the agency's mission. They've been creative in moving their, their cases along. They've been creative in trying to find ways to take testimony, collect evidence, interact with colleagues. Uh, and so, uh, those three things are really stand out from the first uh, three months here. Have you set any goals for yourself during your tenure? You know, first and foremost, it's, it's what I talked about at the top. It's, it's restoring trust in our markets uh, by working with a sense of urgency, uh, you know, in, in the areas that I talked about. Um, I think the second thing uh, that I want to do, and again, all in the hope of leaving it slightly better than I inherited it, is to, to try to find ways to empower the staff. Uh, as I just mentioned, I, I'm so incredibly impressed by their, their dedication, their resilience, their thoughtfulness, their expertise. Uh, they're the ones closest to their cases, and I want to find ways to empower them to do more. And, and if we can do that, then, then that goes a long way uh, to, to, you know, to bringing forth uh, cases more quickly, uh, that robust enforcement I talked about. It goes a long way uh, towards restoring that public trust. Uh, and, and again, um, the broader goal, you know, in addition to that, is, is leaving it slightly better than I found it here. And you mentioned you were the Attorney General of uh, the state of New Jersey. Um, now, effectively, you have to report to a commission. Um, how has it been working in that context of reporting to Chair Ginsler and commissioners? Um, and how is your approach different in that role versus when you were back at, as an AG? Well, it's certainly different. I, I mean, in my prior role, I, I made the tough calls on whether or not to initiate a civil enforcement action, whether or not to pursue a particular uh, firm or, or bring an action against a particular company. And, um, you know, w we had our own process. Uh, but now, you know, I represent a client uh, that has to approve all of our actions. Uh, and I have to engage in a robust process, um, meeting with commissioners in advance of uh, you know, discussing uh, recommendations, uh, trying to oversee more directly uh, the investigative work, uh, reviewing the work more closely. So uh, it, it's different in that sense now that I have, I have to convince somebody else uh, or, you know, 
uh, defend my recommendations to somebody else and before uh, you know, I was that final decision maker. But uh, it's an incredible process to be a part of and I think it, it really leads to good results and good outcomes and, and the right decisions. Now, given your background as a state regulator, do you anticipate that there'll be greater interaction under your tenure between the SEC and state securities commissioners and state AGs? Well, I, I hope so, but but there wasn't pretty there wasn't good interaction uh, when I was in state AG. We didn't always get along and uh, you know work uh, in lockstep as 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 people um, would think we would. Uh, it's my hope that I could leverage the relationships that I have with the AG world and, and uh, state regulators uh, to, to work effectively uh, together and collaboratively together because we can't be everywhere. Uh, and so we need to figure out, you know, which cases are better handled by our, our state counterparts at the state level, uh, which cases are, are better handled by us. And then when we're both working on an issue, how we could work together thoughtfully and, and collaboratively and, and uh, you know, avoid the duplication of efforts because at the end, you know, as a state regulator, you're you're trying to protect your residents and the investing public, and and in this role, we're trying to do the same uh, at a broader level. And so, we could do it much more effectively if we coordinate our efforts instead of having states go out in front on a particular issue, uh, and, and then sometimes even complicate investigations for us. If you know they're litigating something, we're still investigating here and have not brought. Uh, an action uh, against the same firm or in the same space, the risk is always the bad outcome there, whether you know it's case law or precedent uh, that might affect our ability to move forward uh, with our you know with our uh, enforcement action. So uh, that coordination is necessary, uh, and, and I hope I could leverage my prior relationships uh, to to make sure that we're working in in concert where appropriate. Speaking of interactions, there seems to be a growing trend toward more and more joint investigations between the SEC and various U.S. attorneys' offices. What sort of guidance do you give to the SEC staff regarding joint investigations between, say, um, the SEC and federal and state criminal authorities? Well, I mean, let's be clear. They're not joint investigations, uh, first of all. They're parallel investigations. And so, you know, they're Good investigating catch. Good using... Catch, using... <laughs> Good catch. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Yeah. Um, so, so there are parallel investigations. We're not working jointly, and uh, they're using their tools. They're they're using uh, you know the techniques that they have to collect evidence to prove up the charges that they, they may be looking at. But clearly, uh, sometimes the conduct uh, you know implicates criminal statutes, and it implicates uh, our statutes as well. And uh, we both have interests to vindicate there, and we work in parallel together. And so. You know, you know these cases when you see them. They're obvious to us where they cross that line and, and, and you know, rise to the level of both criminal and civil violations. And so, you know, we refer cases routinely to our, our, our federal partners and our state law enforcement partners as well uh, because they bring uh, different remedies to the table. And it's important uh, to have, uh, have them at the table when we're, we're uh, trying to resolve a case or, or look into a particular firm or an individual and to, to uh, root out their conduct or attend their conduct. There's been a lot of talk, um, uh, particularly from, from Chair Ginsler and others, about the importance of environmental, social, and governance factors. Um, what role do you see as the enforcement director in promoting ESG-related factors and changes? Uh, listen, we're always focused uh, on, on policing the market for what's important to investors and uh, ESG issues, uh, particularly, uh, you know, material risks posed by uh, climate issues uh, and, you know, related, uh, related concepts are, are more and more important to investors and to companies' bottom lines. And, you know, we're seeing the explosion of uh, ESG branded products and funds in, in, in the asset management space as well. And, and, and a renewed focus by companies and investors on, on social governance issues. So, you know, it's an area that's important to investors. Uh, there's a lot of talk about rulemaking. There's a lot of talk about regulations, but we have tools. Uh, we have, uh, you know, existing uh, uh, principles and we'll apply those uh, longstanding principles 
uh, when it comes to d disclosure, uh, when we're investigating public companies regarding, um, you know, their statements about, you know, how they're doing uh, with their ESG related uh, policies or, or products or uh, if they're being environmentally responsible. And, and so if they're, if they're material misstatements, uh, those are tools uh, that, that, that we already have. And we've seen that in the diesel emissions cases, uh, which we brought over the last number of years and things uh, along those lines. And if it's an asset manager who's marketing an ESG fund, that asset manager has to do that in a way that's not uh, materially false or misleading uh, and has to a adhere to, you know, their client's mandates and, and um, you know, their, their client's direction. So, so if they're not, then we'll use those principles to hold those uh, asset managers accountable. And that's what we've been doing. So it's not something new for us. It's just using existing tools to, you know, address a, an emerging trend where, you know, people are, whether it's greenwashing or taking other steps to, to, you know, gain financially in the short term and not really live up to what they're representing to the investing public. A few more general questions and we'll open it up to the entire panel. But um, you talked about building off of your predecessors here. Um, but are there any particular areas, as you sit here today, where you think prior enforcement has been lax or needing further attention? No, I mean, you know, listen, I, I think we all take this job to do everything we can to protect the investing public. We may prioritize different uh, areas because, you know, when you make everything a priority, nothing's a priority and, and nothing gets done. And so we may choose to focus on, on different areas, but our overall and overarching goal has always been the same, which is to, you know, to protect the investing public, uh, to hold wrongdoers accountable. And, and my predecessors have done that. Uh, and I hope to continue to do that. Uh, and, and again, uh, you know, hopefully uh, sort of, you know, maybe uh, make an emphasis in, in different spaces. Uh, and uh, but again, the overall goal is the same. And I wouldn't say any of them have been lax in their responsibilities or when they occupied this role. And, and are how's there that, any particular- How's that, Steve? Did I, did I not, did I carefully skirt that one as well? <laughs> you're, you're, doing, you're doing great, Gerbeer. <laughs> I feel like I was being baited there. <laughs> uh, Same goal, different strategy. Some enforcement directors and chairmen have utilized what's known as a broken windows approach, essentially going after everything, no matter if it's a, a compliance lap that was negligent in nature, charge those. Uh, do you subscribe to broken windows? Before you speak, Rabir, let me just correct the record. That's not what broken windows means. But you can describe it, Rabir, I'm sure, probably better than Brad did. Well, listen, I, 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 I dealt with, you know, I dealt with broken windows and the related criticism on the criminal side uh, as, as attorney general. And I don't want to step into the broader debate on, on that policy when it comes to criminal law enforcement. But I think, you know, when you talk about our rules. Uh, I, I think if we have rules, uh, whether it's the form CRS sweeps we did earlier, people might say that's not important, but we have that rule. We have to give it teeth and we have to, you know, we have to show the investing public that we're holding uh, people accountable uh, when we have a new requirement out there that people must adhere to. So, you know, that's just doing our job. It's not broken windows. Uh, and, and it's something that we have to do to give our rule sets uh, teeth. And if we don't, then, then you develop this culture, perhaps, uh, that we're not taking our jobs as seriously. And that, you know, you could, you don't have to follow this particular rule or, or you, know, uh, you know, submit this form or give your client this form because, you know, the SEC is really not looking at it. Nobody cares. And so all of this is important. And Kabir, there's been some rumblings among defense lawyers that the SEC might be planning some changes to the Wells process. Uh, is that true? Are there any changes that are being made or contemplated to Wells? No, listen, the Wells process is an important part uh, of our enforcement process, and, and it allows us to have robust uh, discussion and interaction with defense counsel to, to have uh, robust engagement around uh, you know, whether it's a factual dispute, whether it's a legal uh, dispute, whether you know it, it's a concern with how a case has been handled 
uh, those are all discussions what, that we should be having with, with defense counsel. Those are all discussions that lead to better outcomes. Uh, and there's, you know, we're not going to get rid of the Welsh process. The rumblings are attributed uh, to, to a statement that I made previously and a statement that my deputy made uh, at, a, at SEC Speaks, I believe, where we simply said that not in every case uh, is there going to be a Wells meeting with the director or the deputy? Your Wells meeting may be at the regional director level or at the associate level, uh, but it, it may not always rise to the level of a meeting with the with the uh, director or the deputy because you know sometimes there are not you know novel uh, legal issues at play in a particular investigation. Sometimes there are not factual disputes. Uh, sometimes there are not programmatic concerns. And, and you know, maybe in that case, it, it's at the regional director level because, you know, the other challenge we have is moving our cases and, and moving our investigations to the finish line. And, you know, w when you've had one Wells meeting and you have another Wells meeting and you have a third Wells meeting, uh, it slows down that process. And, and when, when you delay the resolution of a case, uh, it also feeds into that perception or misperception that we're not holding individuals accountable because, the public may have heard about an event two years ago, and they're still they don't feel they don't see somebody being uh, held accountable for that particular event or that particular misconduct. And so, you know, bringing cases to resolution more quickly is also uh, part of, of robust enforcement. That working with a sense of urgency that I spoke about earlier. Now, you have an audience here of mostly defense lawyers, um, many of whom may be asking for and getting meetings from you in the future. What sort of advice can you give the audience about interacting with you? What things would you want to see? What things would you want to find you would find particularly helpful in potentially getting to a resolution in a meeting with you? Uh, three things. Uh, thing one, uh, confront the evidence uh, that's not favorable to you, your client. Uh, so in a Wells meeting, uh, I, I've had a number already. You know, I often hear about the litigation risk we may face. Um, I, I get that, right? Uh, and we have talented lawyers here who highlight the litigation risk for us, and we're able to assess the litigation risk. Uh, you know, take head on the evidence that's unfavorable to you, the evidence that favors uh, our position, and, and address uh, you know, and I think that's that's the first thing. Thing two, uh, I don't find that attacking the staff is effective. Uh, I, again, I respect the staff and I trust their judgment. And so, you know, complaining about the staff rather than talking about the issues is really uh, unlikely to be persuasive, uh, you know, in, in my mind, or at least to me. And, the, and thing three, um, cooperation, uh, at least the sort of cooperation that, that, that results in uh, cooperation credit to me means more than you coming in and telling me how you've responded to lawful subpoenas, how you, you've made witnesses available for uh, you know, lawfully compelled testimony, how you've conducted a purportedly independent investigation and then make a presentation that's largely uh, self-serving and doesn't confront those negative facts that I talked about. So I think those three things uh, are, are important to me and, and are the best use of our time. Let's talk about you know, the evidence that, that is unfavorable to your client, let's take it on head on. And, and by all means, if we're wrong on a particular, uh, you know, a legal position we're taking, let's have a robust discussion about why we're wrong. And, and, you know, let's leave the criticism of the staff that they didn't get it right, or they didn't, you know, they, they rushed to do this, or they, you know, they failed to you know, check this box. Let's just talk about the issue and, and, and get to the bottom uh, line there to see, did we get that one wrong? And if we did, we should admit it. And, and, and you know, uh, I think those are the types of discussions uh, that we should be having in those meetings. Now, you mentioned earlier prior comparable cases where maybe the penalty wasn't enough um, to defer to deter the misconduct. Um, what um, sort of precedential value do prior settlements have? in discussions with you. In other words, can I go in and say, I reached a settlement under Steve and Stephanie for this in this case, and it's similar conduct involving similar case, et cetera, et cetera. Does that matter? And at what point does precedent matter in terms of settlement and, and precedent not matter? It, it, listen, it matters. You know, when we look at penalties in a particular case, we, we look at, at comparable matters. And that's part of the analysis that 
we do when we're presenting a recommendation to the commission. Uh, we look at comps in addition to the statutory tiers and, and in addition to commission guidance. And so a directly relevant comp uh, with similar conduct, uh, you know, it, and it happened a year ago, two years ago, uh, that's a useful benchmark. But I don't think it, it's the starting or ending point. I, I think sometimes uh, I'll get a wealth submission that I've looked at recently, you know, where I'll see 20 or 30 comps, right? Where, you know, a, a talented associate at a law firm has gathered from press releases and, and other sources, every possible comp over the course of 10 years in, in, on, in a particular area. And, and to me, and I raised it in that meeting, I go, well, doesn't that suggest that our, our penalties aren't having the deterrent effect that they should, that if year over year, we're saying, seeing the same conduct, assessing the same penalty, and here we are in 2021 with the same exact conduct, perhaps we need to ratchet it up a little bit to send that uh, not only specific deterrent uh, message, but also that general message of deterrence. So again, they're a starting point, but, but not the ending point uh, of our conversation. In, in negotiating with you and folks working at your direction, um, do you bluff? Um, in other words here by that, would you ever intimate uh, to defense counsel that you may seek in a particular remedy or bring an enforcement action when you don't anticipate you'll have the votes of the commission to do so or that you might not pursue it? Is bluffing permitted, you believe, in negotiations with defense counsel, in other words. And Brad, can we, no. can we open it up to the whole panel as well? Yeah, I'll, I'll do that right now. That's my last. Uh, I'll, I'll be quick too. No. Uh, no, bluffing is not permitted. Okay, good. No, no, it's not, no, I don't do it, nor should we be doing it. You know, we good. have our credibility in these conversations and we should maintain our credibility. Once we lose our credibility, our job is much more difficult to do. So it's not a tactic I engage in. I think we need to be thoughtful and prepared when we go out uh, with our numbers. And, and it, this is not, you know, this is not a bazaar we're running here. You know, we're representing the, the interests of, of our client and, and we need to be thoughtful. We need to be prepared and, and we need to be credible. And uh, so the answer is no. Sure. You raised the issue about seeking admissions and um, George, uh, during your tenure as enforcement director and, and, and Rob's tenure, uh, there was a movement towards seeking admissions as part of resolutions and settlements. Um, George, I'll open it up to you first. On what circumstances should the SEC be seeking an admission? Um, so Brad, uh, I think, so on, when Rob and I were serving at the SEC, I think we dipped our toe in, in admissions um, and we allowed admissions when there was a parallel criminal case where it was just sort of silly to be suggesting in its settlement documents that the defendant isn't admitting or denying the charges or the findings when he or she had just pled guilty to a crime, for example. Um, it was really under Mary Jo when Andrew and I opened up admissions to broader practice. Um, and, and, and even then, I think we used it, we used them very moderately. And after I left, the division directors have used, um, used admissions very, very moderately. Admissions bring accountability, as, as Gabir has said, but, you know, so do adjudications, so do findings, so do penalties, so do disgorgement. And I think in most cases, there's no serious doubt that the defendant engaged in the conduct set forth in an SEC order when they have accepted the sanctions, when they have consented to the findings, and they don't deny the findings. Um, you know, about 10 years ago, I think this issue became really front and center in as a policy consideration, largely as a result of um, Judge Jed Rakoff in the SDNY, you know, injecting questions about the credibility of findings into various settlements that included the no, no admit, no deny language. And suddenly it became very important in some cases where we didn't think that the public would fully accept a no admit, no deny set of findings or allegations to ensure that the defendant had accepted um, and acknowledged the underlying conduct. So I think you know, the first category of cases is where it's very, very important for the SEC's findings to have credibility. And that could be cases where there's some reason to doubt credibility because there's been a lot of public debate and discussion and denial. 
But it could also be other cases where the case isn't really about sanctions. It's not about specifically sanctioning someone, but it's about it, it's about ensuring you know the, the the truth is revealed for counterparties and investors who might interact with a registrant, for example, to understand the registrant's conduct and to make their own judgments. I can think of a number of cases involving dark pools where we thought it was very, very important for people who are participating in the dark pools to understand the actual conduct um, of the dark pools so that they could form their own judgments about whether they want to do business with that dark pool or not. And there are many other examples of it, but it's, it's where you really need special credibility associated with your findings. You're not accepting generic findings. You want detailed findings and you want them to be credible. I mean, there is another area where you could use admissions with very potent effect, and that would be to inflict, effectively inflict collateral consequences on a party in cases involving issue or fraud, for example, if the SEC extracts admissions of the elements of a 10B case from a defendant, that defendant then is going to be collaterally stopped effectively in civil litigation with potentially huge collateral consequences but I think we have never come to the point of feeling like that's a productive use of commission resources to effectively partner with plaintiff's lawyers in those kinds of cases. Um, Bill McLucas, I know you have some strong views in this area. Anything to add? I, I think there's no doubt in the criminal cases requiring the admissions makes sense. I question beyond that, the degree to which you're converting the program into a more punitive one than need be, and you're gonna to add to your litigation risk. One of the things, uh, Gerber, you mentioned at the outset is your overarching objective is create confidence in the marketplace. There's a sense that maybe there are two sets of rules, one for the rich, one for everybody else. Um, and in your speech at SEC speech, speaks, you mentioned empowering the staff in the context of reducing the expectation of meeting with uh, the director or the deputy director. I mean, one of the things I would suggest that you think about and add to that confidence objective here is process. It is really important that people feel like they get a hearing and a fair hearing. We've all sat in that chair and we've all dealt with recommendations and we've all dealt with requests for meetings where when you read the record, you say, do I really need to meet on this? Is it? Um, but I would just caution the staff on closing that door or creating a perception that you're closing it because this issue of confidence in the system doesn't just go to having a tough enforcement program. You deal with a lot of people who are gatekeepers and lawyers and people who, uh, you know, are pretty good lawyers, many of them. And Having their clients have a fair hearing is, is critical to the system and to the process. And you, over time, I think, will, will see situations where when you grant those hearings and you hear those articulations of the defense, the equities, the evidentiary issues and the litigation risk, your sense of the case may well change dramatically. And my only suggestion is that adds as much on the plush sheet of the side of the balance sheet in terms of confidence in the system as getting tougher on penalties and ratcheting up the numbers because people haven't gotten the message. And that it's just a, a perspective that I have having sat in that chair and then been on this side for, for 20 some years. So. Your beer. I, I don't disagree with what, what Bill said, and, but I think we would all agree that there are those cases where, you know, we would a meeting just based on what we all know is not required, right? And so we don't want to take away process in those cases where there are close calls or where there's, you know, they're systematically important or where there are real factual disputes and where, you know, we just need to bring in a, a new perspective and maybe the teams are too close to a case. And so, the, we are reading everything, you know, so w when there's a request, we're reading everything and we're looking at everything. And all those submissions are made part of the, the recommendations uh, that go to the commissioners. And so it, it, I think we can get a sense of those particular cases 
from the materials, but I'm talking about, you know, reducing maybe 5% or 10% of the meetings where it just doesn't make sense. And, and I think yeah, that goes I, a long way. Even, even Andrew, I was able to meet, move the needle just a degree or two, but on occasion, he even was influenced by me. Oh, <laughs> wow. That's very low, Bill. That's very low. I'll just say two things. Uh, just to follow up on something you said. First, I will say as someone who has met with Kabir, uh, in his tenure, uh, Grabeer does give meetings, uh, Wells meetings, and I have to say, um, you know, listens very carefully, and it's a really sort of good, interactive, and, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, so just somebody who has done it. and who's Are heard, you the reason it, he stopped? Are you the reason he stopped? Uh, yeah, 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 there you go. Uh, so that's, a, I, I'm pretty confident I'm not. But the second point I guess I'd make, just follow up with something Bill said, I mean, you know, the, the thing that I always thought, in addition to what Bill said, process and the importance that people feel like they've been heard and that they're that, that the SEC is a reasonable regulator that will listen to reason, uh, which you know is not every regulator. Um, the other thing I think is very important is you have a lot of commission. You have five commissioners. They were all out there giving speeches. They were all at the closed mission meeting saying what they think about things um, and trying to message to the staff how they should actually act and the things they should focus on. And what I always thought was very important is to sort of message to the staff, like, you know, that's all fine. Everybody's going to say their views. That's fine. But you guys should just still focus on doing what's right. Every day we're going to come in and we're going to just do what's right, make the right call. And I heard you, I heard you say that before, Gabir. And I think that's critical because the staff can get, you know, can focus on what somebody says in a closed meeting and really go down a road um, that really should, they should not go down. I'm seeing a lot of nods. Uh, and I think we all kind of have that sentiment as well. And Grabeer, if I could go back to the concept of admissions for a moment, because I think George raised a very good point about collateral consequences of admissions, particularly in 10b-5 cases involving public companies and potentially collateral civil litigation, um, securities class actions and the like that could follow from an admission. Um, is that going to be a factor that you'll take into consideration on admissions and what are really the appropriate circumstances where you'll be seeking admissions? Can you provide some color to us on, on, on where that's going to be? Is it going to be a return to the Mary Jo White Commission? Is it going to be an expansion on that into some new areas? Sorry, the old mute. Um I think George, George raised a lot of uh, really good points, and, and there are considerations uh, that we must take into account when we're considering uh, admissions. But in some cases, there's, there's a special need for public accountability. Uh, there's a special need for acceptance of responsibility. Uh, and the guideposts that we have have not changed uh, since Andrew uh, and Chair White uh, set that admissions policy uh, you know, put that admissions policy into place. You know, it, the guideposts are those cases where there, you know, large numbers of, of harmed investors or the conduct is otherwise egregious. Cases that pose a significant risk to the market. Cases where, you know, admissions would aid, uh, you know, investors in deciding whether to deal with a particular party uh, down the road in the future. Cases uh, where, you know, uh, uh, unambiguous recitation of the facts is going to send an important message uh, to the market about a particular uh, type of conduct or about a particular case. So I think th those are still the considerations that are, are that we look at. I mean, Steph and Steve uh, had a number of resolutions that involved admissions. Uh, we we have not had one yet, uh, and uh, you know we have the no no denies in, in, in where there's a criminal uh, a parallel criminal case, but we haven't had you know, the circumstance uh, where we are seeking admissions from a party. And so, again, I simply pointed to the great work that Andrew and Chair White did and, and, and Steph and Steve have used those tools. And just to say, this is a tool in our toolkit and we're going to look at it and use it in the appropriate case. Yeah, I just, um, I, I agree with you, Grabeer, that, um, you know, there, is, there are important accountability consequences from, you know, obtaining admissions in the right cases. Um, it's, I think one of the things that's challenging is to set out a framework of principles for when one will seek admissions and then actually adhere to them, you know, um, you know, in a principled basis in practice, because 
lots of cases that sort of meet the benchmarks that you would say this is an appropriate case for admissions. You know, there are proof issues or other reasons why, you know, it may be difficult to obtain them. I think the interesting question is, you know, for, for and I had this, you know, when I was in your seat as well, is, you know, when will the commission and or it's, you know, the opposing parties deem it appropriate to litigate for admissions? Um, and I think it's a challenging question for, for, you know, settling parties to see whether, you know, the admission is something that's worth litigating over. And I think it can be a challenging question for the for the staff as well. Andrew can speak to this because I, I don't think it resulted in increased litigation. This was always sort of, you know, what people said, this is going to increase the number of cases that go to trial and so on and so forth. And they were judicious about it. Yeah, it, it didn't because we did take litigation risk into account, which you have to do. You can't, you know, insist in a case where, you know, the evidence is really not that, you know, is not completely strong that you're going to get admissions because then you're going to litigate it and you're probably not going to get anything down the road anyway. So you definitely have to take litigation risk into account. I think that's got to be one of the factors. No, and really, some, one of, sometimes there are hybrids too, where you're not admitting all the, all the allegations or findings, but just the ultimate conclusion. Um, but, you know, ultimately I feel like if you spend too much time on admissions, you're wasting a lot of your time. It's really hard to think of a case that really you should be taking to trial over an admission because it adds some additional incremental credibility to what is already a very credible settlement with stern sanctions, stern findings, and no one doubting what happened. Um, there's also there's also the temptation when you want to have admissions to have there are all kinds of cases where people don't care. They're happy to admit you don't really care. They don't care. And then suddenly you have a whole bunch of admissions because people want to have admissions in cases. And then you don't have any consistent, you just have a crazy quilt of unprincipled application of this concept of admissions. I was just gonna to add to what the others have said, which I agree with, that um, while not um, a complete deterrent for people that are worried about collateral consequences, you may be able to achieve your goals with admissions while providing some language that basically says that the defendant or the respondent can argue facts and laws in their collateral procedures. Good luck. Maybe that maybe that's a you know a high hurdle, but at least it doesn't foreclose them from trying their best in other collateral procedures to to take positions that may not be consistent with the admissions. One lingering question, speaking of guidance from the commission, is is the 2006 penalty statement alive and well? Um, in terms of the guidance of when the commission will seek a financial penalty and what factors it will look to. Uh, I'll open it up to the panel. Um, how do you counsel companies on financial penalties now uh, in terms of what they can expect? I mean, my own view is the factors are the fact, right? The factors have always been relevant. Um, to, you know, and different members of the commission put different weight on different factors. And some factors are gating issues for some commissioners. And I think I feel comfortable saying that not so much for the majority of this current commission. Um, but I think, you know, when you think about what to tell clients, it really is about looking at, you know, all the things we look at, the egregiousness of the conduct in the eyes of the staff, the precedent that's out there, you know, sort of um, the goals that Greer has set out early in this conversation. So, I mean, I think, look, penalties have been a one-way ratchet for many, many years, right? In the big cases, they're not going down. Um, and I think, you know, when we think about how we talk to clients about it, I think it's, you know, look, you've got to assume for big conduct, for a big company, um, when, you know, Grabeer is talking about not just general deterrence, but specific deterrence as well. And he's talked about how he factors recidivism into that. And, you know, we can debate, I think, at length what recidivism is and how it ought to be factored. But I think all those things are, you know, are what we're looking at. But if you look at the trend in penalties over the last 10, 12 years, holistically, they've gone up. Stephanie, while we're on the issue of, of relief, um, 
Grabeer mentioned robust undertakings. Um, I know you and Steve were involved in um, a settlement involving Tesla that had some unusual non-monetary undertakings relief. Um, reflecting back on that experience, um, it, it are non-monetary sort of creative undertakings something that the SEC should be using? Um, or did that open up the proverbial Pandora's box to the SEC seeking any sort of governance changes, even though it might not have the legal authority to get that in court? I, mean, I think in the context of a resolution, it can make a lot of sense to craft a remedy that is specific to the conduct at issue, right? Tesla was a very um, specific set of facts, um, you know, and, and I think if you look at others with facts that call for, you know, sort of a tailored resolution, right? We did it in um, Theranos. There are a lot of cases that have very detailed undertakings like the KPMG resolution, like um, the 12B1 cases, the share class disclosure um, cases had a consistent set of very tailored undertakings that were designed to um, change behavior going forward. So I, I do think it can make sense. I mean, I, you know, I don't think you want to do it for the sake of doing it, but um, in cases that sort of call for something a little more nuanced and a little more thoughtful, it can make a lot of sense. I think the way we thought about it was undertakings were sort of more nuanced a vehicle for prophylactic um, protections going forward, as opposed to let me figure out another way to inflict, inflict pain. Um, and so, you know, and they're really in a settled context, um, you know, there's sort of no limit, I think, you know, obviously subject to reason to what kind of undertakings one can, can, uh, can arrange. But Brad, my sense in the last few years is if you can convince your client to start taking remedial steps before you get to the table. The staff is more open now to listening to those and factoring them into, all right, what do we need to get to get a solution here or a settlement? I think the one thing that you have to worry about a little bit, I, I, I'm thinking about the recent Credit Suisse case, and I immediately looked at that and I thought, oh boy, this case is gonna be a monitor. Um, and then there was no monitor, at least in the United States, I think. Um, the Swiss regulator um, did impose a monitor, but the SEC imposed just very extensive um, quarterly reporting requirements of massive amounts of information. And the only thing I, I wonder about is what kind of a burden does that impose on the SEC? I mean, be careful what you ask for. Somebody's got to be following that. Somebody's got to be checking that. And um, it can be, I would think, quite time consuming based on the extent of the undertakings I, I saw in that case. Kirpir, any any um, reaction to that? Mm -hmm. And um, on the issue of, say, monitors as an undertaking, is that something in your toolkit you're planning to use more? I, I think, you know, Steve and Steph and everybody who, and Dick, uh, you know, are spot on. I think uh, undertaking should be tailored uh, to address the specific underlying violations, uh, they're an effective tool to ensure future compliance. Uh, you could limit uh, activities or functions or operations of the company, or, or you could also require the settling party, as you just mentioned, to hire uh, an independent uh, compliance consultant to review policies and procedures in the future to determine uh, improvements that can prevent future misconduct. And as Steve said, uh, it's a prophylactic uh, remedy and, and, and it, it's something that they use. It's something that we'll continue to look at in using in future resolutions uh, and could be an effective tool to prevent future misconduct. We're coming close on the witching hour here on our time. Um, so Gerbeer, as, as is tradition, you always get the last word. So any parting words for the audience in terms of the road ahead, advice to us, uh, anything you'd like to add? So, uh, you know, I probably gave 200 plus speeches as attorney general, and they probably didn't generate a single law firm bulletin or alert. And I gave two as uh, as director, and they've generated a whole host of alerts and bulletins, which many of you have shared with me. 
you know, I've highlighted admissions. I've highlighted my views on penalties. I've highlighted in my views on the Wells process. I don't think I've turned down a meeting yet. Uh, this is all just sort of saying we're looking at ways to, to prevent you know, future misconduct to protect investors, to empower the staff. And these are the things we're considering. And so, you know, give me a little bit of runway here. And, uh, and, and this is all great guidance, uh, you know, that, that Bill uh, and others uh, provided me during this session. Uh, and, and I look forward to getting more guidance from my predecessors in private uh, next in the future. And, uh, you know, uh, and I think, again, we all share the same goals in this role uh, to make sure we're doing everything we can uh, to protect investors and, and to really, you know, leave it better than than each of us found it. And that's my goal here. Wonderful. Well, Gabir, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. And I'd like to thank the um, the entire panel. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Gabir, uh, for your sharing your thoughts. And to the whole panel, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Uh, we really do appreciate it. Um,